buonasera a tutti e a tutti, eh, è un piacere veramente aprire questa sessione del nostro seminario su Roma Republic eh, e presentarvi una relatrice che non ha bisogno di presentazioni ovviamente, ma comunque giusto per dire due parole veloci su di lei, eh, Marta Garcia eh, Morsillo insegna eh, Ancient History at, eh, di Rockhampton University in London eh, e tra i num suoi numerosissimi interessi di ricerca si segnala in particolare un lungo, un grosso filone di studi sull'economia romana, con particolare attenzione al rapporto tra le attività finanziarie e i commerci nel, nel Mediterraneo. Poi ha sviluppato anche un notevole interesse sulla ricezione del mondo antico in vari media, sia visuali che non visuali, letterari, culturali, e tra appunto le sue attività e, e co-editor uh, della, della bellissima collana Romescapes dedicata appunto ai luoghi fisici, agli spazi fisici di Roma e il, i, analizzati in maniera diacronica e mh, vorrei menzionare soltanto l'ultima monografia tra i numerosi eh, lavori che ha fatto l'ultima monografia appena uscita da pochissimo pubblicata insieme a Cristina Rosillo sul Managing Information in the Roman Economy cioè una monografia estremamente innovativa perché eh, ha utilizzato, ha analizzato eh, il ruolo dell'informazione nei rapporti economici, quindi analizza l'informazione come una risorsa economica. In effetti il monopolio dell'informazione era fondamentale eh, per lo sviluppo dei rapporti contrattuali e appunto nel capire come funzionava nel mondo antico è un approccio secondo me estremamente innovativo che sono convinto, no, non dico mi auguro, sono convinto che avrà un grandissimo impatto eh, negli studi sull'economia romana nei prossimi anni. Ma lascio subito a lei la parola, eh, appunto la ringrazio per aver accettato di eh, partecipare al nostro seminario. Um, I'm flattered uh, di questa presentazione, <ride> veramente che non merito per niente, e volevo soltanto ringraziare eh, Mattia e Federico per questa invitazione che per me è un gran piacere, anche un onore e una gran responsabilità anche. Eh, a responsibility, and I change now to English, because of course I don't consider myself to be a researcher in, in the Roman Republic, but uh, somehow in the last years I have developed this interest because of course, in particular because uh, there is uh, an author that you can not avoid if you work On, uh, on Roman economy, if you work on, on Roman economic mentality and uh, Roman financial history, and that Cicero, is of, that, that author is of, is of course uh, Cicero. So my interest in, uh, in the Theophytes, and I'm sharing, I'm trying to share now the, the PowerPoint here, um, rises actually, of course, some years ago when, when I uh, was working on my, on my uh, PhD, Um, which was about uh, Roman auctions. And, and uh, I was really interested in this work because it gave us some clues, or it gave us some clues about the, um, how actually um, economic activity was inserted in some sort of social system, social system of uh, moral system. And, and this moral system, of course, is explained in, a, in an amazing detail in this absolutely fundamental work for the history, for the economic history, but of course for the history of philosophy and for the development of philosophy uh, and the influence uh, among others, of course, of stoicism and in economic ideas and its translation in economic ideas. Now, the project that I'm presenting is in, uh, of course, is a, is a work in progress pretty much. I'm in a, in a very, very, very preliminary stage of this, uh, of this research and um, It's important to mention that it's part of a bigger project, uh, a project so supported by the HSC and the uh, German uh, Research Council, the DFG, called um, Twisted Transfers, Constructions, no, I always forget the second part, it's about the uh, discursive constructions of corruption in ancient Greece and Rome. And uh, my uh, commitment and my aim within this project is uh, specifically to investigate the notion of twisted trade or trade economic activities that not necessarily were labeled as illegal, but were certainly considered uh, in some, within some ambiguous or in, in a very ambiguous way uh, in, uh, in categories, negative categories linked with immorality. 
Um, sometimes, of course, and I'm particularly interested in these great songs between uh, and the, the different perspectives over the same practice, the same act, and how everything can be interpreted in, in different ways. So this is beyond illegalities. And uh, of course, the Ophikis is very, very, very important, as I mentioned, for the um, for an understanding, for the understanding of the development of the um, of the history of financial uh, financial thinking, but also economic thinking. So after this <laughs> big introduction, I'd like to show you my next slide. Let's see if I can manage to. <clears throat> Which is this, that if, if my face for any reason is covering any of the <laughs> this important text, uh, let me know. This, um, as you can see, uh, this is not mine. I have extracted this from, uh, from a website. So I was looking for ideas on value. So I'm going to talk, I, I didn't mention it. I'm going to talk about value, yeah? The concept of value. Because the concept of value oof, is a very, very, very uh, tricky, very elusive uh, idea. Um, we, when we ask what we think about or, or something is valuable, something is not, you can express this in many different ways. Um, from a social perspective, cultural perspective, economic perspective. Now, uh, I'm of course interested in this economic perspective, but even though this posed me with, with some really, really very difficult situations. And one of them uh, is of course, what is value today? So I went to one of these so great and multinational financial institutions, in this case, the bank ING, and, uh, and I found that they have a description of what for them value is. So when I, we read this, and I can, I can uh, read it loud just, just to, to emphasize it, yeah? As a global bank, we bring more to society than just our financial value. Value is created through our business model, where we transform various inputs or capitals through business activities and interactions to produce outputs and outcomes uh, that create value over the short, medium, or long term. Our value creation model is a simplified way, it's a simplified way of showing how we create value for and with our stakeholders. Now, let me ask you, what do you understand under value after reading this? It's a rhetorical question, but <laughs> you can answer if you want. So, of course, if you're an expert in, in modern finance, as you say, this is very clear what value is. It's not, it's clearly not. Uh, I, as a historian, even if I'm interested in economic matters, I see it as a, as a conundrum of ideas that are quite, let's put it in a way, um, self-contained. So, um, and that of course explain, that they're explained by themselves. So what is value is what, what this uh, bank does and what is that, does it have really a translation into economic productivity or it remains within this sort of conundrum, which is financial activities and financial products. And, and, and of course, you, uh, when you read all these words, you could also be talking <laughs> to a certain degree uh, because we used to, uh, we are very used to these concepts and we also use them in other contexts, for instance, in the academic context as well. No? We all uh, do outputs and <laughs> we search for incomes and et cetera. But it's, it's say, something that is not understandable certainly not understandable for the common customer, perhaps not the big investor, but the common customer of this bank. And of course, this is all surrounded by a series of, of visual ideas, among them this one that illustrates very nicely the, the website where this is located, in which you don't see much of this so economic ideas behind, but everything is social, cultural, but the idea itself of value is very, very, very elusive. So what is value? Value is a quite polysemic and use very elusive and malleable concept. In a sense, the notion of value helps us, everyone, articulate individual and collective choices, preferences, beliefs, and emotions. Value is a social construct, a convention that arises as the outcome of a progress of negotiation. Value also operates at different cognitive levels. It can concern the appraisal of objects in the market, but also our personal or collective judgment about things, material or immaterial. Because, because value resists one-sided definitions, but it still remains 
an essential notion to understand the framework under which societies are organized, the concept is very dynamic and views can be also manipulated. In economic terms, today, um, so for instance, it's not the same uh, to, uh, it's not the same thing, value is not the same thing as, for instance, at the beginning of the 20th century, during this industrial revolution, or during the Enlightenment. So when we think about value, we need to be very cautious, of course, about the applicability of this concept in other historical periods and in other economic systems. Now, I became very interested in this very famous book by uh, Mariana Mazzucato, the value of everything. And, and it is from here where I took uh, actually the title of the uh, current papers, not publicity, but it is, is really a great book. So making and taking in the global economy, the value of everything. This book was published in 2018 uh, by the economist Mariana Mazzucato and offers a critical view of how value has become actually a subjective category uh, that we simply have to stop questioning. The concept of value changes, as I said, across history and mentalities. And uh, according to Matsukato, there is the assumption that value is actually today in the eyes of the beholder. And there is a lack of questioning of such assumption. According to Matsukato, the criteria used today to decide if an activity is value creating or not is very, very, very thin. So we measure value by whether it ends income. So, and the quote is very clear about that. You end income because you are productive and you are productive because you earn income. Circular arguments that wipes out the idea of an earned income. The idea of the distinction between productive and unproductive activities is used rarely, rarely uh, discussed today. And in fact, so if we look at what happened from mid 19th century, which is also an aspect that, uh, that Matsukato um, researches, there has been an important shift in the conceptualization of value from being an objective category that could be, for instance, mercantilism, uh, so Adam Smith's idea of uh, in, within this, so the, the, the importance of, of, uh, of trade. Um, According to Marx, of course, labor is the is value, capital is, a, is an equivalent of value, et cetera, et cetera. So there has been a shift from different, from a different understood as an objective category of value to a more subjective one that is tied to individual preferences. Uh, and as a consequence of that, tell us uh, Matsukato, the production boundary that used to define value, agricultural product of work, labor, um, products of trade, et cetera, or industrial product, et cetera, has blurred. So the financial markets like the ones and corporations like the one we saw before uh, are the perhaps clearest or the, the, the most clear example of this subjectivity and ambiguity of the concept of value today. So. I became in, very interested in, in how to trace this in the past. We know, for instance, uh, Adam Smith, uh, the, uh, the Wealth of Nations, but also his work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, they both uh, are very feed from the ideas of Cicero and Cicero's Theophikis as well. But how is this actually, how, how grows in Cicero these ideas and, and how are they received? So I became very interested in that and also in the relationship between value and the concept of wealth itself. So if we move to Rome, um, and we have even more problems to find uh, uh, an exact identification between a modern concept of value and uh, what we could consider what the ancient Romans understood as a value. If we remain in economic terms that we can of course always transfer into social and cultural values as well, but uh, this is different. So, we remain in the in the framework of the of the economy of social economy, we have to say. Um, we see that there is doesn't exist an uh, exact equivalent of the term in Latin. Instead, in matters concerning things submitted to economic judgment and pecuniary considerations, ancient Romans use a large variety of expressions that reveal 
different notions of value, but also a deep understanding of its functions. Typically, the cost of a property on the market could be defined with expressions like quanti venire possunt, well, verum, aequum, and justum pretium designated a general concept of value that attempted, as much as possible, to detach itself from the high degree of instability and fluctuations of market prices. Well, also keeping, or seeking, sorry, seeking to be recognized by the relevant parties as an acceptable and fair price. The judicial valuations or estimaciones, by which a judge resolve conflicts of ownership, as well as matters such as the division of properties and the fixing of fines and compensations, these aspire to become an undisputable verum pretium. Such impartial arbitrations did not overlook other kinds of value, such as the subjective individual appraisal of a thing, quanti mea est, which is very, very common in literature, or the pretium or estimatio ex affectu or affectionis, which express a sentimental value with a difficult monetary translation. So I'm very, very interested in tes testing uh, value as a concept that helps us better understand how Romans thought and expressed economic preferences, choices, concerns, mental mentalities, and motivations. Now we move to, finally, <laughs> to Cicero's Theory of Pickies. Um, of course, Cicero's Theory of Pickies have been uh, widely, and broadly, and deeply studied by, by uh, remarkable scholars, uh, let me just mention, from Pierre Grimard to Miriam Griffin, Emanuele Narducci, Claudia Motti, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So big, 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 uh, big names and scholars who have become interested, not only, of course, in the, in the philosophical learnings of the and importance of the work, but also its political importance is, is it, the contextualization of the work also at the end of Cicero's life and, and political career and all the connotations that this work has as a sort of testament in life. Now, uh, I'm not going to, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> um, go deeper into that. We just go straight into the concept of value, but, uh, but let me just uh, contextualize a little bit uh, what the Ophicis is. So, as I say, Cicero describes his own work as a testament for life. And in the very role of the pater familias, he offers his son, who embodies at this time the future generations, the only hope, perhaps, a rationalized moral framework, a guidance for action based on a balanced system of virtues, which is dominated by principles of social reciprocity. Accordingly, the exchange of acts of kindness and the praxis of giving and receiving are meant to contribute to the general good, so it's communis uh, utilitatis, in harmony with the natural law. The historic do uh, doctrines of uh, Panaetius, Panaetius, guide Cicero's discourse of uh, the need to reconciliate the often conflicted relationship between honestas and utilitas. The caseload provided in book three in particular helps illustrate this conflict in situations in which economic profit challenges what is morally right, but also in which the search for the good becomes not an aim by itself, but just a mere instrument to obtain an advantage. An obvious remark, of course, what is morally wrong is not always an illegal act. And this is something important in the work. Uh, I will say very, very, very important, very relevant indeed. And this invites to consider the very nature of the act. So Cicero unpacks this problem following Panaetius, I read. First, people question whether the contemplated act is morally right or morally wrong. And in such deliberation, the minds are often led to violent divergent discussions. Finish the, quote, the quotation. The possibility of having different views upon the same action leads Panaetius to evaluate the utilitas and the very aims of the action. So with the idea of quo bono. The ba basic idea that helps identify rightful and unrightful um, self-interested action is the principle that features as an axiom from the natural law throughout the whole book. 
this is the self-interest, or the, the idea is that the self-interest should never intentionally harm others. Activities destined to enlarge the property are legitimate, provided they observe this principle of justice and remain restricted to the private sphere. The separation between public and private affairs legitimates this Cicero, or Cicero's defense, uh, of the right to enlarge the res familiaris, even for those who did not contribute to public life, for instance, by holding an office or become a magistrate. Panetius' ideas are complemented by Cicero's own exploration of a specific examples of wrongdoings provoked by self-profit, and these are specifically unpacked in book three. I remain here because I haven't commented the second text. A central factor and theme in Cicero's exploration of the causes of wrongdoings is his particular interest in the use and instrumentalization of knowledge in of actions that often escape punishment or that navigate within the gray zones of what is legal and what is not. This is explicitly, explicitly stated in the following passage, so 373, let us put our principle to the rest. If you please and see if holds good, if those instances in which perhaps the world in general finds no wrongs, for it is connection. It, for in this connection, we do not need to discuss cutthroats, prisoners, forgers of wills, thieves, and embezzlers of public monies who should be repressed, not by lectures and discussions of philosophers, but by chains and prison walls, but let us study here the conduct of those who have the reputation of being honest men. So these are very clear cases that are of course interesting for Cicero, but not so interested as, as those that remain in more so ambiguous zones of morality and corruption as well. So less explicit are the cases that build the central passages of book three which uh, look in detail at the effects of asymmetric information uh, on economic decision and practice. Uh, let me say that this topic is uh, discussed in a collective volume that, uh, that uh, it was mentioned in the introduction, recently edited by Cristina Rosillo and myself, um, and with wonderful contributions by others. A typical phenomenon of asymmetric or imperfect information is silence and more specifically, lying by omission. To illustrate the dialogue between the Stoic philosopher Diogenes of Babylon and Antipater of Tarsus, who was Panagia's teacher, Cicero introduced a constructed moral dilemma framed by the ideas of scarcity and need. This is a very, very, very famous passage of the work and still very, very important, so it is worth uh, commenting it and, and go through this. I quote, suppose, for example, a time of death and famine at Rhodes, which provisions at fabulous prices, and suppose that the honest man, the fear of bonus, has imported a large cargo of grain from Alexandria, and that to his central knowledge, also several other importers have set sail from Alexandria, and that on the voyage, uh, he has sighted their vessels, London, grain and bond for Rhodes. Is he to report the fact that the, uh, to the Rhodians, or is he to keep his own counsel and sell his own stock at the highest market price? I am assuming the case of a virtuous upright, and I am raising the question how a man will think and reason who will not conceal the facts from the Rhodians if he thought that it was immoral to do so. But who may be in doubt whether such silence will really be immoral? end of the quotation, the exclusive use of information here by the seller and its hiding from the buyer is unambiguously condemned by Antipater, while Diogenes holds a very different view, as of course in this, typical in these dialogues are. I read, according to Antipater, all the facts should be disclosed that the buyer may, that the buyer may not be informed of any detail that the seller knows. According to Diogenes, the seller should declare any defects in his wares. In so, 
insofar as such a course is prescribed by the common law of the land. But for the rest, since he has goods to sell, he may try to sell them to the best possible advantage, provided he is guilty of no misrepresentation. And then it follows, I have imported my stock, Diogenes merchants would say. I have offered it for sale. I sell it, I sell at a price no higher than my competitors, perhaps even lower when the market is so who is wrong? Now <laughs> That's my words. Diogenes reasoning justifies the uh, fairness of a price setting that follows the logic and economic competition within a market of scarcity. The price of Diogenes seller is fair in comparison to others, regardless of the fact that the process that led to it was far from being transparent. So as you can see, despite the historical and cultural distance, the self-contained logic is not that far after all from those of the credos that sustain the idea of licit profit in modern capitalistic free market societies and particularly within the context of the financial market. So think about the price uh, and uh, th that quotation uh, by uh, Matsukato the thing that tells us that the price by itself defines the value of something and use also the judgment of what is fair and what is not. So it, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting echo. Antipater's answer deviates clearly from this argument. And I quote, what say you, comes Antipater's argument on the other side, it is your duty to consider the interests of your fellow man and to serve society. You were brought into the world under these conditions and have these inborn principles which you are in duty bound to abide and follow, that your interest shall be the interest in the community, and conversely, that the interest of the community shall be your interest as well. Will you, in view of all this facts, conceal from your fellow men that relief is plenteous supplies, is close at hand for them? I don't know why I read uh, Antipater as an angry man. <laughs> he was angry in the dialogue. So, Diogenes' reply in the next passage insists on the moral difference between concealing, so calorie, and not revealing. So there is an important difference according to him here. It is one thing to conceal, uh, Diogenes will perhaps reply. Not to reveal is quite a different thing. At this present moment, I'm not concealing from you, even if I'm not revealing to you the nature of the goods or the highest good, uh, and to know this secret will be of more advantage to you than to know that the price of wheat has, was done. But I am under no obligation to tell you everything that it may be to your interest to be told." End of the quotation. Antica um, Antipater reminds Iogenes next, using the same expression, nekese est, which is repeated in both, of the obligation that brings together men in society. <clears throat> yeah, Antipater will say, but you are obliged, nexe est, as you must admit, if you will only bethink, bethink you on the bones of fellowship forged by nature and existing between man and man. The pan dialogue concludes with Diogenes' critical defense of private ownership. I do not forget them. The other will reply, but do you mean to say that those bonds of fellowship are such that there is no such a thing as private property? If that's the case, we should not sell anything at all, but freely give everything away. So, so pre, pre date of, of a sort of communism here. It is at this point quite clear to the ancient and modern reader that neither Antipater nor Panetius, Panetius nor Cicero himself question any rights to possess or transfer goods uh, and properties. The problem is entirely moral, but what is important here is that this morality uh, directly informs the function of the individual within the collective structure of society. The constructed case of the rotten grain dealers is of course a very, very clear example of a, scar of a scarcity market or why not as well, a scarcity marketing 
that speculate with the scarcity of a product in order to increase demand and prices. The consequences of omitting information are in this specific case, very dramatic, in fact, a matter of life and death, collective, so not just individually. Less dramatic, of course, but certainly important to strengthen Cicero's argument of the need to observe the interest of others are provided in the next passages. The intentional omission of the facts in the real estate market and in the sale of the slaves are discussed next by Cicero with the aim of confronting his audience with the very common problem that affected business transactions between individuals. I am not going to scrutinize these specific passages that are very well studied and have been also the focus of recent research about the impact of hidden information and market transactions and on the strategies such as signaling, uh, which aim to mitigate the problem of adverse selection. So in fact, so uh, let me mention Christina Rosillo who has recently worked on this in the case of the sale of uh, uh, sales in the real estate market and um, Miles Laban, who has done also the same in the case of, of, the, of the slave market, using this text and others also complemented by, by uh, legal sources as well. So <clears throat> even if, as Cicero recalls, these wrongdoings and trickeries regarding hidden information were regulated by law, which was itself inspired by natural law, and are well documented in the Edilition regulations, in the digest, for instance, the author insists that something that can be right according to moral law can be also forbidden by moral law. Sisters and conclusion is long marriage to illustrate it. From this, we realize uh, I'm sorry, do you have any problem? This is source of right. Marta, we missed the last um, yeah. 50 seconds or so. We have some problem. It is not you. in accord with Maybe stop the screen sharing, probably. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I, I don't know how long I have been away and talking. <laughs> 15 seconds, yeah. A, a minute. Okay. A minute. Let me, okay, let me ask you something before I continue. Was the audio coming through okay during yeah. until I disappear? Or it was like uh, interrupting the but Because no, I could it, just remove it. It was just fine until about a minute ago. Let me let me know if something like that happens that the audio doesn't come through well. Just let me know immediately, okay? okay. Just, thank you, thank you. Okay, I share again. And I'll try to find out where we were. Just last, I think. Is the last, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, no, I think that was the text, I think. Yeah, and I read it already. I think I read it, I'm not sure. I, I give it as, uh, as read, so the text on the, on, on the conclusions. I'm not sure. Okay, I do it again. Conclusions by Cicero on this argument. From these, we come to realize that since nature is the sort of right it is not in accord with nature that anyone should take advantage of uh, the other's ignorance. And no greater curse in life can be found than knattery that wears the mask of wisdom. Thence come those countless cases in which the experience the utilitas seems to conflict with the right. For how few will be found who can refrain from wrongdoing if assumed of the power to keep it in absolute secret and to run no risk of punishment. Less obvious cases of moral wrongdoings leave the door open for ambiguous, more ambiguous interpretations than these ones that we just saw. This is the case, for instance, of uh, generosity or liberalities, both in the private and in the public sphere. 
These acts address the question of the purpose of such, such transfers and the very essence of the principle of reciprocity from self-interested gifts to the formula do udes and pure altruism. But even there, some nuances need to be observed. Cicero makes clear that nobody should sacrifice their own utilities and surrender to others uh, what they need for themselves provided no harm there are again audio problems in your stone to others benefit excuse me marta excuse me i i have audio problems also again people of justice okay i'm going to hold um nobody from Now, I'm trying to, okay. I'm afraid it is the screen sharing the problem. Uh, Marta, I, okay. I wonder whether so you're going to go for a radical solution and just turn off your video, which I know is-, is That's hard. what I'm trying to do. Yeah, ah, okay, here. Okay, I'm going to turn my, my video, so it will be even more boring, but <laughs> I hope it, it works. I hope it works, yeah. I'm really sorry about that. But can you see the, uh, you cannot see the PowerPoint now. I can still see the slide, actually. You can see the slide, yeah. and uh, yeah, can you? Okay. Um, there you go. Let me just. Uh... <clears throat> okay, here we are. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. Really. Yeah. So <clears throat> we remain though in the private sphere. Back to the end of book one, Cicero displays in strict order his list of professional occupations, professional professions, yeah, from less to more important for society. The list is clearly informed here by the entire system of the value of the book. No. No, there is a bad internet connection. Yeah. It's, I, I think it is also the, the screen sharing the problem. Uh, he starts with those professions that are in actually are the tax Yeah, we'll turn off our videos, as Federica suggests. Maybe. Uh, I don't think it's, it's our fault. I think it's uh, the problem is the screen sharing because the screen sharing uh, use lots of internet connection. That's, probably that's true. If Marta uh, only speaks, we, we can if 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 we yeah. only use our voice, it will be better than uh, using screen sharing on videos. Yeah. So we can uh, try, of course. Marta, would you mind sending us your PowerPoint? Uh, mm -hmm. by us, I mean, Mattia and me, and then we can send it to the whole mailing list. Mm -hmm. And then we, we will need to do the, 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 the screen sharing. We'll all... This is a good solution. Yeah. Computers. You still there, Marta? Uh, probably <laughs> not. I think, I think we just lost the speaker. Okay. Well, yep. uh, okay. <laughs> Well, it concludes, it? Returns, but, um, sorry, everyone. It was bound to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. mm. I are still here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, we, I think we can I feel hear. very frustrated. <laughs> okay. I feel very frustrated. I'm really sorry. I'm, like, I'm back again. <clears throat> yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Right. Um, yes, so okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do in order, you know, because this would be a pain if I, if I continue. So I'm not going to read the text I was going to, to read. I'm, I'm moving now towards the end of the, of the presentation and then we can uh, try to discuss this in the, in the discussion if, the, if, 
okay. the internet connection uh, survive. Yeah, I, I'm afraid it comes from my side because it's, it's a very weak connection, and I'm really sorry for everyone who is oh, here no, listening to this. It's a pain. Yeah, right. sorry about that. No, it's quite okay. Right. Um, that's the problem of not uh, you know, working at home, one of them. So I, I mentioned these two texts that uh, I didn't quite uh, manage to read about this system of gradation system, or, or is a, is a very clear organized system of professions or economic occupations in which um, the worst considered other than uh, some workers who dedicate, dedicated to manual, uh, work and, and, and work connected with sordid activities. Um, he's concerned about this as speculators. So uh, in particular, he mentions the tax uh, collectors and also usurers. Not by chance, because of course these are, even if they are necessary for society, this is something that he doesn't mention, but their condemnation, let's put it in that way, fits into his, uh, his system, moral system, in which of course productivity uh, in many senses, is a social productivity and lies elsewhere. Um, and for the same reason, for instance, he's more ambiguous about um, trade because, of course, uh, sorted mercatura is not the same as magna mercatura. And trade, provided it is useful, collectively useful, like those traders, grain traders from Rhodes, and actually this text can be directly connected with that one in the third book. Um, traders of course, they are absolutely necessary. The more if they are connected, of course, with the productive estates of agriculture. He, he mentions agriculture in a very, 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 uh, that's a, a text 151, uh, in a very, let's put it that way, idealized way, following Catodiel, but not even exploring the many nuances uh, of, of the agriculture and which Cato the, the, the unpacks this idea that, that within the context of, of this so, uh, new context of, um, of expansion, expansion is Roman expansion within the Mediterranean and, and this new so large state, productive state. So this is another topic. But Cicero makes it clear that of course there should be a connection between agriculture uh, and uh, productive estates, I would put it that way, rather than agriculture in general, and of course, uh, um, uh, trade. So the text continues with a positive comment about those who invest in agriculture, as I mentioned. But as we can see, Cicero's gradation of economic activities and occupations sweeps an idea of productivity intimately linked with the socially embedded good man, the highest version of the maker. Mercatura remains an ambiguous, not necessarily censorable activity, which depends on the aim of its profit. The part of the takers is comfort above all, as I mentioned, to the speculators that benefit from the profit of others, the tax collectors, the usurers. Um, I could include here bankers, but not quite because it's a different category. Even if they are necessary for the system to work, they kind of activity clearly clashes with Cicero's conception of what is valuable and to use honest. So where does actually value lie? So at this point of this uh, accidental presentation, it is quite clear that Cicero's concept of value is a system that balances individual interest and collective good. Beyond Panaetius, beyond Panaetius actually, Cicero offers a clear scale of value, responsibilities, and obligations to observe that to pose ambiguity and uncertainty. The social community that sustains this system is alluded in the following passages. This is from uh, book two. I'm going to read it. I quote, why should I recount the multitude of arts without which life will not be worth living at all? Or how will be the sick be healed? What pleasure will be the hill enjoy? What conforms should be have if there were not so many arts to minister to our wants. In all these respects, the civilized life of man is far removed from the standards of the comforts of wants of the lower animals. And without the association of men, cities could not have been built or people. In consequence of uh, uh, city life, laws and customs were established. And then came the equitative distribution of private rights and a definite and a, a definite social system. Upon these institutions follow a more human spirit. 
and consideration for others, with the result that life was better supplied with all it requires, and by giving and receiving by mutual exchange of commodities and conveniences, we succeed in meeting our wants. So, end of the quote. Economic profit, and I'm finishing, has this only proper sense within this balanced social system of reciprocity. Either in public or in private life, individuals are expected to contribute to the collective good. Wealth and benefits are to conceived as a collective matter, something that concerns the community and not just the individual and the rest familiaris, and that needs to be submitted to check and balances. Cardinal virtues such as the decorum moderatio modestia, uh, continentia, and temperantia become just essential to observe private behavior and, to, and as counterpoints of the risk and excesses associated with utilities. And I finish with the very last <laughs> part of a uh, very short quotation in which uh, after these three books, uh, Caesar and, and his uh, poor son, really not listening or not at all, but uh, because it's a dedication to, to Marcus, young Marcus by then in Athens, he says, herewith my son Marcus, you have a present from your father, a generous one in my humble opinion, but its value will depend upon the spirit in which you receive it, indeed. so. This is, uh, um, as we can see, value <laughs> in this case, this work is also uh, something that uh, is submitted to judgment. In this case, the personal judgment of, of Marcus. Okay, thank you very much. And, and really, really sorry about, about all these um, problems. <laughs> I have to shorten again, uh, a little bit. <laughs> well. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I try to reappear, okay. and if, if think... something happens, then I, I, I will hide myself again. Just to, okay. Okay. To, to thank you. Offer thank my you very face much. to criticism. <clears throat> Grazie, grazie mille. Bellissimo, veramente un bellissimo paper. Uh, anche con i problemi tecnici in realtà era, era, il messaggio è arrivato comunque. Sì, il messaggio eh. era non re... <laughs> don't read so much text. <laughs> Particularly with that uh, old translation, in that very old translation. Co yeah, comunque, ehm, chiederei allora se ci sono delle domande, mh, aprire la discussione, se qualcuno ha osservazioni o domande, mh, vi prego di farsi avanti. Mi sembra di aver visto una mano alzata pe di Pedro, vero? No, non era così? Pedro is hidden. <laughs> ok, vabbè, intanto che voi pensate... Eh, io sono rimasto molto impressionato da tutto questo discorso che, eh, di l'uso di categorie morali per esprimere l'economia alla fine era proprio un linguaggio mm, almeno sono sempre più convinto sentendo la tua relazione mi è servita molto eh, proprio per questo perché mi sembra appunto che il problema di linguaggio dell'economia quello che a noi ci manca e loro lo esprimevano usando la morale o il diritto eventualmente il, il, il riferimento che hai fatto al giusto prezzo, all'ecum, l'utile, sono due categorie di carattere morale e giuridico che servono per esprimere i fenomeni economici. Mm -hmm. Diciamo che gli antichi non avevano una teoria economica è semplicemente perché non avevano... <ride> è un problema di linguaggio, io almeno la vedo così in questo senso. Proprio la posizione tra inter, inter ecum e utile, l'idea proprio del prezzo naturale, che poi alla fine però il prezzo naturale qual è? Quello di mercato? Mm -hmm. In molti casi sì, almeno... In Cicerone sembra di sì, in altri forse autori un po' meno, eh, se vediamo ad esempio l'editto dei prezzi di Diocleziano, tutto il suo discorso sull'importanza di prendere un... ritornare al giusto valore dei beni, no? Imposti con la forza. Eh, C'è una forte... è un dibattito che appunto va, va veramente... affronta due, due categorie, concetti mentali molto, molto importanti. Oh, bene, ma non era una domanda la mia, era più che altro no, è, 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 un, è un commento bellissimo perché, perché infatti... Uh, should I talk in English? Um, as you prefer, as you prefer. English, Italian, Spanish, as you prefer. Okay, I answer in every language. Well, every language I know, not those... Latin. Latin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, infatti, I, I, um, sei riuscito a definire molto bene, molto meglio di me, eh, la questione principale che io non ho discusso naturalmente qua è perché non c'è una teoria economica. Mm. Eh, eh, evidentemente c'è questo, non direi un problema, eh, è un dialogo, una discussione sul, sul ruolo del linguaggio mm. in rapporto o anche con l'identità pubblica, l'identità sociale eh, esatto. dei cittadini. 
Questo è molto importante, non si può capire questa modalità senza capire tutto il sistema della città e, e, e dal punto di vista sociale. Allora non lo so se sarebbe possibile una cosa come un manuale di economia che è sempre stata la critica che si fa sul eh, sviluppo dell'economia antica, né, né nel, eh, nei tempi passati, già abbiamo passato una, altre fasi, ma, ma è certo che è così. So, so, yeah, so I, I will agree with you that this is a system of language and is, is um, heavily informed, of course, by the social um, scaffolding. I don't know how to call it. Okay. Not a new idea, of course, this is, this is something that has been explored already. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see in the chat room that we have some question. Um, I, I, I follow the order. Uh, so, Cristina, please. Yes. Uh, well, uh, hi, Marta. I'm sorry. Cristina, I, I mentioned you. I mentioned you twice. I know. So don't I know. Criticize me. It's, it's a very nice question, Marta. <laughs> it's very polite. This. <laughs> sorry, I cannot turn off I my know camera. You. I know you. <laughs> That's it. Um, I was. I thought it was very suggestive how you frame at the beginning, how you explain uh, the ideas uh, by Matsukato. And I see, I mean, that they have really a lot of potential in the, in the work that, that you are pursuing. Um, and I was wondering if, you've, if you have seen, if you consider that there are differences between uh, the, you know, subjective evaluations or subjective uh, values. And for instance, I wouldn't say objective, but more state values such as the ones for instance that appear in the formula of the census or when the state mm -hmm. officially values uh, something do you see different conception of how that value is 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 thought about um, this is a very good question because of course the majority of information not just of course um, um the, okay the majority of sources we have talking as you know about the uh, valuation about the estimaciones and and from the side of the state and the churches, et cetera. Uh, of course, they tend to, to describe very specific circumstances, but and they, they tend to be presented as objectified, as objective uh, entities of, or, or concepts, because of course, uh, the, these are very important functions that need to be respected because uh, is, is, is low. So the problem here is when, when, when we start exploring this text more in depth, indeed they enter into an absolute conflict or the, the sort of again self-contained circular argument in which even the uh, the appraisals uh, in some cases it's, it's more or less easy to make an appraisal of a property uh, when you have to divide the property and you have to take an uh, so the arbitrary uh, decision about that but um Usually, of course, you have to rely on aspects like comparison, aspects also that very, very commonly enter into the realm of what is subjective. Um, because, uh, and, this, uh, and this is, of course, a topic that you are very interested in, uh, to what extent we have this sort of registered, and you can imagine the sort of registers, of course, of properties in which uh, prices were also introduced and, and, and uh, phases of inflation, deflation, could be taken into account in the appraisals. So all these requires an immense work of research from the side of those officers who in the end did the work uh, that have to enter into the terrain of the subjective as well, and not just objective. And, uh, but let's, let's put it that way. It, it also happens today. Think about the work of real estate um, um, agents and how they evaluate your property. And sometimes, you know, because you need to take into consideration many aspects like mobile, um, um, objects and, and, and the, the location of the house. The, the, uh, so this is, this is something that it, it very often transcends the boundaries between objective and subjective. And, and I think the, so Matsukato has, has really, re, um, uh, she what she proposed is a very, very intelligent way, an understandable way of, uh, of discussing these this notions of how actually the financial markets and financial institutions have appropriated and proposed and appropriated their own idea conception of value. And we just accepted it without discussion, without criticizing it, because we participate actively in the system. And I know that some of us criticize the system, but still <laughs> we participate in it. 
I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, but I think it's one of the problems that we have. Indeed. Yes, it does. Thanks. Thank you both. Uh, Federica Lazzarini. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much for your paper. It was really interesting. And I was thinking about what you said about um, value not having a Latin equivalent in um, a perfect Latin equivalent. And then that passage uh, that um, appealed to nature as um, the law coming from nature, it brought to my mind something that Jade Settle said, um, a, a case that he made uh, a couple of years ago in a paper on linguistic naturalism, where he argued that, especially in this time, uh, that was the language of the day to discuss um, terminology that was not yet very much defined. And he argued, and I wonder whether this might be of any, uh, whether you think that this might be of any relevance to your point, that um, appeals to nature, especially in literature of this period, are used to justify, um, as an attempt to find a principle of explanation that went beyond just um, law or habit, just a way to justify human behaviors um, on grounds that are not just, just empirical. Uh, the basis of that claim being that because nature can mean everything and anything, it, it can't really be refuted. So it's up to, but it's left to the author who appeals to nature um, to, to use a term that they will know that the speaker, that I'm sorry, that the, that the listener or the reader will automatically associate with something. So it's just a rhetorically charged term that is just used as a wild card. I don't know whether you think that it might be any relevant to, to your point of, um, the fact that value doesn't have a Latin, a Latin equivalent, but there is an appeal to nature as a source of, of, uh, of value and, and right and law. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so nature he is, is the fundament of, uh, of Cicero's construction of, uh, of value and of the relationships and, and, and the patterns of behavior that, uh, that needs to be observed and uh, criticized or, or praised. So, uh, and uh, and of course uh, this is pretty much developed as a, as a sort of eclectic, eclectic not eclectic so very, very much so well thought but uh, but uh, um, evolution of, of not just platonic ideas but of course uh, the stoicism and academicism and in the case of of stoicism we see here how he really tries to somehow revitalize this this so the cardinal virtues and give them a context. So what he provides here is a context. It's, it's this, this idea of the scaffolding, I, th I think it's very good because it, 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 it provides also the idea of that we are in a period of change, in a turning point, in, uh, in not only so transition between the Republic and the Empire, but this, this notion that has been so well started by Claudia Morti, for instance, this notion of decline, of moral decline, requires to go back to nature and to the principles immutable of nature. That of course, as you say, is again, loaded with, with a rhetoric uh, language. And, and that, that's, that's extremely interesting what you commented because it may be an explanation of this lack of, um, of commitment to a word that describes something that is, is changing. But it happens to us as well in a different way. So in the, in the contrary way, the concept is changing the word is not. We still we call value for everything, and but the concept is changing continuously. So um, it has to do also with the way we think and we categorize these words. So a uh, very very interesting. So lingu from a linguistic perspective, but unfortunately I have <laughs> no idea on on linguistics. But it's it's really really very 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 good. Thank you, Federica. Okay, we have also a very interesting comment uh, by Emilio Zucchetti in the chat room. Uh, Emilio, would you like to expand it or? Not really, it was just a passing comment to second what you were saying about the moral uh, and economic uh, values overlapping. And I thought about the Fides bond, I think it's 287 or someone like that. Um, and there's clearly this, this overlapping between the moral meaning of fides as bond and the 
financial meaning of Fides. Uh, and indeed, Cicero there says explicitly that is Fides the value on which the whole uh, Kivitas is uh, laid, is, is based. But just was just this, I didn't have a question, just this comment. Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, if we compare the concept in, in Plato and uh, in Cicero, there has been a, a massive change in, in mm -hmm. development of the concept. The same for, of course, for the Greek bonus. Um, that you know, start being a citizen <laughs> that is respected to, to become someone part of the of the structure. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro, sorry for making you wait. We don't hear you. I'm not. I'm not hearing him. Pedro, unmute yourself. Probably is a problem of his, his microphone. Uh, no. No. Maybe write it in the chat. Maybe, yeah. Sorry, I cannot hear your voice, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, oh, should I should I look at the chat? Or, or, yes, you sorry. probably. Should. I, I haven't I haven't been looking at the chat, so I probably have ignored. He will he will write his question, question in the chat. He will write his question in the chat. So. Oh, now, I, now we can hear Pedro. Uh -huh. No. No, it was me, actually. Sorry. Ah, sorry, Matthias. OK, so where are so, we? Um, just ask the feeders question by me. in the chat, so perhaps we can go ahead with OK. The whole... Of course, of course. OK. Uh, I was saying has a Irene. Question. We have Irene Leonardis. Oh, Irene. How are we for this? Now Pedro is back, maybe. Hello? Se me oye ahora? Yes. Sí. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hola, Marta. Perdón. Oh. Sorry. Uh, was, well, may, may I speak now or, or yeah. should I wait? Uh, no, yes. no, speak. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Marta, bueno, hola. <laughs> eh, ¿Te hago la pregunta en español, en inglés? O... Como, como quieras, como quieras. Bueno, pues rápidamente en español. Uh -huh. eh, a ver, digamos que en los últimos tiempos la investigación ha cambiado mucho respecto de los planteamientos de Finley sobre la economía y se ha aceptado una visión más de mercado, ¿no? de la economía antigua. Sin embargo, entiendo yo que la, la lectura del de Ofikis eh, encaja bien con los planteamientos de Finley de una economía muy en depth, ¿no? en los valores morales, ¿no? en donde la aristocracia está digamos, limitada por una serie de valores predominantes y no puede atender solamente a cuestiones de beneficio o de profit. ¿no? Entonces, ahí hay como una discordancia, es como si estuvieran viviendo en una economía de mercado, pero la ideología no es congruente con esa economía, parece como si no se hubieran dado cuenta de que en realidad estaban actuando en una economía de mercado. Eh, vaya, vaya pregunta. Bueno, nah. es, una pre es una pregunta, y lo eh, hago un resumen eh, corto, muy cortito en inglés. Es una pregunta que naturalmente eh, nos eh, lleva a, a todo lo que son los, los nuevos estudios de la economía romana, eh, que lo que hacen es precisamente cuestionar lo que es eh, las, eh, las teorías del neoclasicismo económico, que hasta prácticamente pues, 20 años eran dominantes. ¿no? El post-debate de primitivismo, uh, modernismo, um, que nos lleva a libros como pues, uh, Peter Timmin, etc. ¿no? Uh, pero precisamente, precisamente, uh, Diofikis es muy relevante si lo, que, uh, si lo que estamos estudiando son aspectos como behavioral economics o approaches, digamos, o uh, estudios sobre uh, la, la economía comportamental o estudios sobre eh, información, economic information is now, uh, so uh, now I changed to, to English, sorry, uh, economic information or economies of information is, is, is uh, super relevant at the moment, um, trend in, the, in, uh, in economic uh, history, but also economic studies because that and behavioral economics, because what it does is contesting the uh, traditional ideas of the homo economicus, the rational man, Uh, that were so, so, so um, important in uh, neoclassical economics. And within that context, we, of course, go back to Finlay, we go back to Polanyi, and we go back to the theories of reciprocity, but, of course, with a new vi vision of this. Just to, to, to remind that the, um, the 
current uh, wares of, of the new Nobel Prize in Economy are, um, are uh, two scholars who have worked extensively on, well, I know that because of course I work on auctions and they have worked on auctions, but they work on auctions from the perspective of, uh, of also asymmetric information and information economies, but also from the influence of aspects like psychology in, in, uh, in theories like, uh, so game theory, for instance. So all this is now also in a way, I wouldn't say revolutioning because it's evolving and developing, but it has already had an impact in the studies of the ancient economy. And we have seen it in, 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 uh, in modern studies and current research of so some of the of <laughs> present here. So Pedro, thank you for that question because it contextualizes, of course, the paper. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, Irene. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Marta, for your paper. I was just uh, in between a, a question and a comment. I was wondering, um, because uh, this idea of um, economical terms and values uh, um, led my head to uh, the etymology of Moss, uh, which is a kind of uncertain, but uh, Moss, uh, uh, for someone, uh, is, uh, it has to be linked uh, uh, to the idea to, to measure. So really, uh, measuring something uh, is uh, how to um, apprise uh, what we have to do and what we should do. Um, so maybe it can also be developed this, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe an element uh, for uh, <laughs> developing again this etymology. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very good point, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it has to do with the idea, yeah, of measuring, of course, by measuring is also, uh, it has to do with, with controlling and of course, uh, understanding how something works. So, uh, so yes, so this, uh, this idea of a, of a price evaluation uh, that, uh, that is behind the term, it, uh, it's, uh, it's very relevant. It's completely relevant because, because of course it defines our approach to things uh, and how we um, set things within a system. That's how we appraise something. Uh, we define these things, they can be material or immaterial according to how we are attached to them. And of course, when these things are just being, uh, being judged within the context of the market, then is the price is just one of the expressions of value that these things have. But there are many others, even if those things are submitted to the market and to, to economic exchange. So it, it's very complex because, of course, the activity is complex and because, again, the idea of embeddedness uh, doesn't doesn't finish with with Finlay, but fortunately, also it uh, it it grows. Um, it's very very complex. Thank you, Irene. Thank you to both, uh, Riette. Thank you very much, Marta. And I completely sympathised with your struggles with the internet. I had that the last two days, so. Completely sympathize. Um, one comment and one quick question. So when you put that slide up with the uh, ING Bank, it reminded me that the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, delivered the wreath lectures on BBC re fairly recently, I think starting December into January, where he exactly talked about why have we now just talked about financial value and not other types of value. So that might provide a, another sort of a uh, recent example of some of the modern thinking on that. Um, I'm sure you know of this already. Um, but my question is um, whether you are also, I mean, whether you're going beyond the Republican period and going into the imperial period. And I'm particularly thinking of Seneca's, how can you say, comment on use, reuse of Cicero's Deofikis in his De Benefikis. Yes, Seneca is fundamental for uh, for this project as well. Yeah, <laughs> this question. Uh, yeah, in fact, in two weeks, uh, I, I have to present something in the, in Biden on on well, not in Biden, hopefully yeah, at home again uh, on on Seneca and Seneca uh, remains of both uh, so letters and and the ben Benefikis is uh, I wouldn't say the natural continuity of Cicero's thoughts in this matter, but it's uh, it's fundamental. Also because he also expresses all their ideas that, that are complementary to Cicero. And um, so, yeah, 
fascinating. Not necessarily the reading you will do when you go to bed, but but, <laughs> but yeah. So I would say yeah, this is not restricted to 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 Cicero or to the late Republic. So um, it, it will expand. Even though you have not uh, you have not delivered this paper, would you say so? You say it's an, perhaps a natural continuation, but has Seneca's the different situation Seneca is in, and I'm not just thinking about the emperor sitting there, but also that, whether that has had an influence on the way he, he looks at value and uh, the intentions behind uh, economic transactions. Well, possibly, because of course, this, this kind of, of uh, philosophical text with, uh, which really address very deep um, um, questions, they tend to, uh, not always, but they tend to be written uh, when, when they're written by authors that are politically active and, and so important in the public sphere, when they write these sort of very, very deep things that, that you think, gosh, this is something that is really thought for in the long term. It's like a long running text. It's not the only one, but, but it's, it is like that. And when, when, you, when you look at, uh, at the Benefici's, it's something also very similar. So you have the feeling that these guys have been just sitting <laughs> at home like we, <laughs> and, uh, and just uh, trying to develop this, this very deep ideas to detach themselves. We're connecting, of course, but trying to understand what is happening. Uh, and, and of course, also this, this um, not really good understanding with, uh, with rulers and, and conflicts with rulers because they themselves, of course, are part of the system. So yeah, but I haven't thought much, uh, much uh, so deeper about that. Uh, in respect to the first, um, um, the first idea, or, or just you know, connecting Seneca and Cicero, of course, one of the topics that that brings them together very, very strongly, uh, and this uh, was was researched among others, for instance, for instance by by Miriam Griffin, is is uh, the topic of gift giving uh, and uh, and the system of reciprocity and gifts, donations, etc. So this is, this is you can see the influences there. But the first question about the, the financial value and, and the questioning of the financial value, this is happening now, it's happening. So Matsukato's book had already a big impact and it's not the only one that, uh, that deals with this, this matter. So a fundamental work also that has been translated from, from, French, is, from French is uh, André Orléans, uh, The Empire of Value, which is mm -hmm. also a book that, that has transcended uh, the, uh, the very restricted, um, um, academic uh, context of, of, uh, of economic historians and, and historians or sociologists. So something is happening out there in terms of we are starting even uh, listening to uh, politicians uh, contesting, not necessarily left politicians, uh, contesting uh, the system and this assumption of the financial value. Because of course, we have to learn something from the crisis of 2007, 2008, even if we don't seem to learn much. Um, as we know so typically about humans, <laughs> we always make the, mis the same mistakes. Sorry, long, long answer. <clears throat> I was waiting. Thank you. We have also a question from Alice Petruzzella. Um, I don't know if you can see me and hear me. Yeah. No. Um, good evening, first of all, and uh, thank you, Marta Garcia, for your paper, which I've been looking forward to uh, since I've I've seen the um, the flyer of the seminars, uh, since I'm really passionate about Cicero. Um, so my my question is more of a musing, actually. Um, since I've been researching the topic of uh, consensus omnium bonorum in uh, Cicero, and um, I've I've been reading and and trying to understand the concept of of um, otium combinitate in uh, in processio in the oration processio mm -hmm. i've 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 i don't know i've been thinking about the possible uh, links between the uh, vir bonus um, as stated in um, in cicero's de Officis, and the, the 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 concept of value trans transcending uh, just the economic field uh, and going a bit more into the moral and social field of the of the uh, bonus vir, who also can devote himself not only to negotium but also to otium. So I don't know if if 
if it is possible to, um, I don't know, um, draw a line between the um, social impact of, of the bonus beer in the in the sphere of autumn and the and the fact that you mentioned also about um, the the, um, the the subjective uh, uh, worth of of value in our society and the fact that uh, it is it there is a very fine line between productive and unproductive. Um, I don't know if this is, um, is is a feasible concept to to drop into this uh, is into this frame, but it it just uh, it just got to me this um, this possible parallel um, between the autumn and negotium and valuable non valuable the value linked to income um, societal value and economic value. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, yes, absolutely. So value is a social concept. This, this is something that, uh, that uh, it's very clear in Cicero, it's very clear also in, uh, not only in Deo Ficus, but also in other works uh, by Cicero and in other authors as well. So it's a social construct. Uh, it is, and it was. And uh, as such also the, uh, and of course, we talked before about natural law, but elements like the beer bonus, elements but of course it's, 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 it's a whole institution um, are fundamental to understand in fact this connection between the different spheres of society because the very bonus is in the end nothing else but um, I would say a personification of uh, trustworthiness of someone that has the legitimacy also to, to take decisions to, to, to win or to, to to deal with conflicts and at the end that this figure will be uh, later on become an institution by itself. But this, this legitimacy of the, the bonus and of also other elements that, that we can see also in the work. Um, of course, this, this social impact is, is fundamental and, and it's very, very, very important to, uh, to understand other spheres of society because what, what Cicero does is, is, a, is a social guidance that of course has as a focus economic activity, but not just also how you behave in private, how you behave in public. So it's all connected. All your being, yourself, all your identity is impregnated, of course, or informs uh, what you do and how you do it, it both in private and public. And, and that, that's the point he wants to make. And that's why he focus and he insists on activities that are ambiguous and he also talks about magistrates, he talks about bribery, he talks about corruption in the public sphere with public money. But he's partic here is particularly interested in disclosing, in making the readers and us as well aware that this also happens in the private sphere and that what we do in the private sphere not only informs the public, but also uh, builds ourselves as social beings. So, so the very bonus is, is a fundamental concept to understand the evolution of this of, of these ideas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw in the chat that Federico Santangelo would like to comment. Thanks, Mattia. Um, it's a question, actually. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, greatly enjoyed it. I, I wonder whether I can bring um, war and violence into the picture and notably civil war. After all, that's the context in which that work com comes about. Now, there's, um, of course, a very familiar connection that's established at least in early modern thought and which is still there in many strands of contemporary thought uh, between um, trade and peace, right? This idea that you have well-ordered, so orderly trade and sort of more generally commerce uh, among men uh, than uh, human beings more broadly, uh, you also have peace, or you also have the conditions for peace in the long term. Does this connection at all emerge in, uh, in the Deofikis or in any of the material you've been looking at, even beyond, beyond Cicero? This idea that, you know, if there are shared principles on how to, indeed, do business, on how to transact, and then on how to create value, then you can look forward to prospects of uh, peace and civic order. Wow, yeah. <laughs> of course, um, um, 
economy, of course, happens uh, in times of conflict uh, and war and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a period of peace. But of course, what, uh, what Cicero is describing here is an ideal situation of a stability in which um, uh, businesses are conducted in a, within a society that works. In a society dominated by chaos, in which institutions are contested or being contested, and, and um, the Tumblr period is, is, uh, is very characteristic <laughs> about that. Um, there is, of course, economic profit. There are people who profit through economics, but there is no stability. Institutions don't work, or institutions, or there are some institutions that work, but they are not fully functional. Uh, or perhaps they work, they are fully functional, but they are not um, respected or they are not, uh, and if they're not respected, they cannot work. And without those structures, economy cannot work in the way in which Cicero describes it. So both concepts are completely interconnected. And in fact, if you look at, at the narratives, economic narratives in the, in the age of Augustus and afterwards, and, and I'm thinking about an author, not many, uh, connect with this sort of more theoretical ideas like a struggle. Um, here what we see is a, is a clear connection between uh, prosperous trades, thinking in the long term with structures that work, of course, the Augustan uh, Rome and, and the reform of the provinces and, and everything and the peace and the seas and, um, and, and prosperity. Um, and the idea of providentia, for instance, the concept of providentia and how it is used in this in this idea of the foreseen uh, is pretty much something that uh, can only happen in a context of, uh, of stability and fully functional institutions. Um, yeah, which doesn't mean that great ideas cannot flourish in that period, as we can see <laughs> in our texts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Are there um, questions? Are there any, any, any questions? Okay, Roman, please. Uh, thank you so much, Martha. Uh, ju just a very short question from a person who's not very aware of these discussions. I wonder if this example which Cicero uses, uh, if the choice of this particular example, I mean the, 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 the question of delivering uh, grain to a city uh, is significant for your argument. Because I, I might have, I, there were some problems with the connection, I think on my side too. So you probably said something about this, but just in case, thank you. Thank you for asking that, que that question because that was the point that was uh, interrupted. It's fundamental. I mean, it, it, this is a very, very well known text uh, from the Ophites, not only used by experts in this work or uh, in Cicero, but, but is, uh, is used massively, of course, to, to also to, to discuss uh, stoic theories about, about uh, also public utility, etc. The case of grain is essential for many reasons. Uh, it's essential for the economy of the Romans, it's essential for, um, for political legitimacy. And of course, we are in a period in which also the monopolies over the uh, grain supply um, are fundamental also to maintain power and to, to also acquire power. So uh, the Cura Nona, for instance, was uh, in the hands of Pompey, and soon it will pass in the future to, to Augustus, who will turn this into a huge institution, politicized institution, fundamental for the stability of the, of the Principe. So the case of grain is fundamental because also is an essential uh, commodity without which you cannot survive. It's a commodity that you can store, so it's not ephemeral, is a commodity that, uh, that as a consequence of that, also you can trade with that and you can, it's natura, so you can compare it and transform it into money, into a kind of money. And we have um, the Juris Gaius, for instance, in the second century, talk about deposits of grain that are being used as sort of banking deposits. So this is an amazing thing that can be a commodity, but can also be a, a fungary, so use it as money. So on the one hand, so it has all these components. And then there is, of course, the absolute dependency uh, of Italy of the grain uh, imported first from Sicily 
and all the conflicts connected with that, political conflicts connected with that, and afterwards from Egypt. So it has many, many implications, even if the case study, which is constructed, of course, uh, of course, comes from, from Hellenistic Rose, which was also famous harbor and, and imported exported of commodities. Uh, it's fundamental at different levels. And that's why CISO chooses it, social, economic, political. Thank you for the question. That's, that's very important. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Very, very impressive paper with a super provoking discussion. So we are, we are really very grateful to you for this. Well, I think Federico, you can stop the recording now, probably uh, before you let go. Me, let me thank you. Let me thank you uh, really for this wonderful discussions that has, because it's a, pr a work in progress. So I'm, I'm just starting rethinking and, and it has been wonderful really to, to think back and, and to, uh, you know, to, to try to develop some ideas out of this. So really inspiring discussion. Thank you very much to everyone. Before you go, just a, a quick remember of the next week, uh, 